The White Bear Area Chamber of Commerce and SCC TV are proud to present Your Business Matters, dedicated to your business needs. The White Bear Area Chamber is a nonprofit business organization serving as advocates to the White Bear Area and its business community. Now, here's the Executive Director of the White Bear Area Chamber and the host of Your Business Matters, Tom Snell. Each month, we interview community leaders and local business owners so you can be informed about the developments in our community. I'm pleased to welcome Nicole Thretham, the newly elected Ramsey County Commissioner from District 1, which represents much of the White Bear Lake area. Uh, Nicole and I will discuss what areas a county commissioner participates in and what she sees are significant issues that face her district. Thank you for uh, joining us today. And uh, I think the first question that I want to ask you is, not a lot of people know about what a county commissioner actually does. Oh, right, that's absolutely true. So what are, yeah. what, what does a county commissioner do? What are they responsible for? So your county board here in Ramsey County represents um, their primary prior priorities are setting the policies and defining the budget for all of the county services that are offered by county government. And services offered by county government include um, actual implementation of a lot of the health and human services programs that are funded by state and federal dollars. Uh, there is the parks, roads, libraries, community development, uh, as well as the, the parts of the county government overseen by our sheriff and our county attorneys, so the justice system as well. Okay, all right. When you mention, uh, for example, health and human services, mm -hmm. I think I read recently about uh, what's going on in the state of Minnesota with their Department of Health and Human Re uh, Services. Uh, is there, uh, Ramsey County in the state of Minnesota, what's, what's the difference between mm -hmm. the health and human services issue that the county does mm -hmm. and the state does? Well, so uh, in terms of human services, most of the programs offered in the human services realm in Minnesota are state supervised and county administered. Oh, okay. All so right. a lot of the rules and policies are set in state statute for how we I implement okay. what is often a federal block grant. Uh -huh. And then the actual place you would go to if you were a person in need of those services is your county agency. So the state oversees how counties, and in some cases tribes, administer mm -hmm. these programs for their constituent, but the people actually doing it, if you need so that help. county, county implements staff. those. Yeah. Yep. Oh, yep. okay, okay. Yeah, it's really the implementation arm of a mm -hmm. lot of state programs. Now, um, what are the, uh, uh, what areas do you actually serve? Oh, what communities? <laughs> Yeah, so um, I am the, the representative for District 1, which is most of the northern suburbs along the northern border, all the way from Moundsview to White Bear Township. Uh, so the Moundsview, Arden Hills, Shoreview, North Oaks, Fadness Heights, Gem Lake, and White Bear Township. Uh, most of Moundsview, not all of it, uh, about mm -hmm. three, three out of the four precincts, as well as a sliver of St. Louis Park, the part St. of St. Louis Park. Not, sorry, Spring Lake Park. Oh, Spring Lake Park, okay, all right. <laughs> Going fast, Spring Lake Park, the part of Spring Lake Park that's in Ramsey County, uh -huh. that's in District 1. And then there's a small portion of Blaine that no one actually lives on, uh, that's all that's commercial in Oka industrial. County, right? There is a small section of Blaine in Ramsey County oh, okay. that no one lives on, <laughs> that's gotcha. part of okay. my, All right. <laughs> District 1. All right, okay. Now, a um, little bit about your background. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, what, what, what's your background? Mm -hmm. uh, what type of work do you do? And yeah. what made you decide that you wanted to uh, be a county uh, board member? Ab absolutely. So um, we can uh, go back a bit in terms of my background. I, I grew up here in Ramsey County. Um, my my parents divorced when I was very young, but we both both my mom mom's side and dad's side moved to Ramsey County when I was fairly young. Uh, my dad settled in Venice Heights and lived there for 30 years. Uh, my mom and stepdad moved to New Brighton when I was five and I started school in the Mountain View School District K through six before my mom moved to Coon Rapids and that's where I graduated. Mm -hmm. um, I did my undergrad at Hamlin and my focus was um, I, I started wanting to be a K-12 teacher uh, education was, was a passion of mine and then I got really frustrated with the schools that I was placed in and knew that um, 
I'd be more interested in the administrative side than a long-term classroom experience. Mm -hmm. After I graduated, I decided to go back to school and study uh, early childhood education. Uh, one of the, the biggest factors for me in not wanting to become a K-12 teacher is I felt like a lot of the kids that I wanted to reach in high school had already checked out. Uh, and this was right about when all the great research was coming out of the Minneapolis Federal Reserve Board about what a quality early childhood education can do for at-risk children. Mm -hmm. uh, with my master's degree, I went to work in the child care field. I ran a child care program in St. Paul as well as did some coaching with child care programs across, across the Twin Cities uh, through a nonprofit that I worked for, uh, really focusing on improving quality and access for low-income children to quality childcare settings, uh, and also involved in the board of a nonprofit that's no longer around called Child Care Works, advocating mm -hmm. for that. Um, and a lot of that came out of my work directly with families who had low incomes. I, the center that I ran uh, was really fortunate that we had this diverse population, uh, both uh, socioeconomically but also racially diverse families. So you got to see a lot of the experiences and struggles that families had at all levels. Mm -hmm. And the way that, in many ways, yeah. the systems we set up to support them were, were in fact presenting barriers to them, which is what got me involved sure. in advocacy. Um, I did study public policy at the University of St. Thomas and then transitioned to working at the Department of Human Services uh, in their child care assistance program, so helping uh, low-income families uh, actually access subsidies so that they could go to child care mm -hmm. and get to work. Um, I, I came at a time uh, where you know the program was experiencing a lot of challenges and, and continues to do as we balance that, that line between making programs more family friendly so that we're actually balancing mm -hmm. the, the work support aspect of what pa parents mm -hmm. need and the child development aspects of what kids need, but also trying to make it sure. more of a 21st century program using modern technology to ensure funds are being used yeah. appropriately. So yeah. that was one of the big challenges we faced there. Yeah. Um, and in that work, uh, I primarily worked with local county and tribal human services agencies helping them administer programs. So I worked with a lot of county workers across the state of Minnesota, um, both answering their questions, making sure they were applying policy correctly, as well as providing training and resources. Okay. One, of the, uh, <clears throat> one of the things I think that's a, a, a real interest you mentioned with early childhood education. There's been some studies that show that if you uh, do uh, proper work with uh, students actually mm -hmm. before they even start kindergarten, mm -hmm. uh, the financial rewards that were, are paid mm -hmm. off are far better than what one would do if they didn't deal with that population mm -hmm. as those uh, kids move forward. And I'm wondering if you could uh, expand a little bit on that. Yeah, well, I mean, <clears throat> the, the old adage of an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure is, is okay. really evident in the early childhood field. And so um, back to the, the Fed Reserve Board research of Art Rolnick and what I think what he found was return on investment was somewhere around every dollar we put in, you get 12 to $13 back. Really? That mm -hmm. much? It's a very high return on investment. And part of that depends on the quality. You need to make sure you're investing in programs that mm -hmm. are really high quality, that are helping children develop both socio-emotional uh, socio, uh, skills as well as cognitive okay. skills that were supporting families in that yeah. work. Um, and, and that's because childcare serves multiple functions. Sure. You know, we support obviously the development of children, but we also support families and being able to get to work and support their family. Mm -hmm. And then we're also supporting businesses because, you know, one of the biggest crises we see right now in, you know, in this environment where we have very low unemployment and finding good workers is there are good workers that can't afford to go to work because childcare is too expensive. Um, so when we make that more accessible and that quality more accessible, we're helping multiple parties. So yep. that's where you see that return we'll on investment. Into that a little bit more, but yeah. uh, interesting uh, what you bring up. Um, as far as uh, our communities go here in, in White Bear, is uh, there's uh, there's a lot more um, uh, there's a lot more people that are. I won't put minority because what. Mm -hmm. um, Caucasians are minorities now, I think, if you add all of the different uh, <laughs> races together. Are, yeah. So I'll say different, uh, there's a lot more d different racial makeup mm -hmm. in this area than yeah. there was maybe uh, mm -hmm. 20 years ago. And do you find that that uh, has some impact on some of the economics in the White Bear area, for example? Um, 
I don't know if I, if I can speak to specifically in White Bear, but we, we certainly see here in Ramsey County okay, that there are yeah. disparities in, in being able to find a good job, being able to, to obtain mm -hmm. safe, stable housing, being able to obtain you know the educational yep. outcomes that we see. There are disparities. Yes. Um, and a lot of that can be predicted both on uh, not only just socioeconomic status, but also race. And, and I think you know a lot of these things are tied together. You, you know, there's research out there showing that um, if you are a, a man who is black and are similarly qualified to a man who is white, you are still less likely to get the job. Um, so if you, if you think about it, it takes you a little bit longer to find those jobs. You're not likely to be paid as much, especially when we look at women, um, black and Latino women make even less than white women who make less than white men. So we, you see mm -hmm. those pay disparities come out and then that's talking about equal qualifications. We're not yep. you know, comparing <clears throat> to the fact that so. a lot of times women are in, in fields that are compensated less. Um, so all of those factors kind of compound on one another. So it's not just one thing that we can pull mm -hmm. out. Okay, so what do you, uh, as far as your position, mm -hmm. what do you look at as being the top primary issues mm -hmm. for the area that you yeah. serve in the first uh, district? Well, when I, you know, I've, I have talked to a lot of folks in the first district throughout the, the last six months. Um, I did a lot of door knocking and events and talking to people. And there were, there were a lot of common themes that I've heard. A lot oh, of people. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Uh, one, of the, one of the strongest themes that I heard from the people in my district is passion for the environment and concern about climate change. Um, and, and the immediate impacts that we're seeing in our community already. So uh, if you look at Shoreview, for instance, we are seeing flooding and flooding that is threatening families and their households. There's a whole community in Shoreview that um, you know, was built 40 years ago and now because of the, the high rains and, and warmer weather, weather over the last several decades, there are 27 houses at risk of total loss if we experience a 100-year flood because our infrastructure wasn't built for this warmer are there, weather. Are there programs in that area for, uh, there's a lot of energy loss because mm -hmm. of, of in board businesses and homes mm -hmm. based on insulation issues and things like that. Does the county have programs that can help mitigate that, which is part of the whole climate issue? Um, so, that, so that is different than when I was going with the water issues oh, okay. uh, in terms of direct county programs. I, I, I know a lot of our CAP agencies have energy assistance programs, okay. um, but I'm not aware yet of, right. of specific county programs. More what we're seeing is um, overlapping jurisdictions and the challenges of what do we do when we have homes at risk and we're also the only place to put this water is in our public entity because right now where the water has been diverted to keep it out of people's homes is into our parks. Mm -hmm. And that reduces the benefits of the parks, which for a lot of people are the amenities and the reasons why they choose to live in my district is access to some of the most beautiful parks. Okay. Other, other issues that you've run into besides, besides that that are mm -hmm. you know, real locally focused? Yeah, so, so I think some of the broader issues and broader conversations that we're having nationally have a direct impact on the people in District 1. So concerns about high health care costs and the compounding impacts of high health care costs. Um, and then for our seniors, the challenges with um, low increases to Social Security tied with uh, property value increases making their homes unaffordable. For families, um, millennial families like mine, it's the compounding factors of high health care costs, student loan debt, high child care costs, and uh, low supply in houses that are in their affordable range. How does the, how does the local uh, county yeah. board deal with some of these things like health care costs are basically a, a national issue? Yep, um, it's a national issue. The la lack of, of um, affordable uh, long-term care facilities for mm -hmm. seniors that's more of a national issue, uh, you know, uh, Medicaid, mm -hmm. tied into Medicaid and things like that. So how would the county deal yeah. with some of these things here you know, that seem to be more globally uh, targeted or more nationally targeted than? You're absolutely right. There's not a lot of count the county can do over high health care costs other than making sure that the programs that we are implementing to support it, support families experiencing that are implemented well. Um, and I know that's something that I talked a lot about coming from human services, something I saw across the state mm -hmm. is um, those county health and human services programs being implemented in a way that were very difficult for families to navigate and caused more, oh, okay. more challenges in bureaucracy. So <clears throat> if we can keep people on those programs more effectively okay. when they're eligible, 
available for them. Good. Yeah. Well, that, that brings me up to the issue of efficiency, mm -hmm. you know, and the uh, proper use of tax dollars. Yeah. As you know, there's um, taxes seem to go up. Yeah. And so um, obviously everybody wants to make sure that the county government mm -hmm. is very efficient in mm -hmm. using tax dollars mm -hmm. and uh, do you have any ideas of how, mm -hmm. uh, I know that you just started, right. but do you have any, any thoughts about ways that mm -hmm. maybe the county could be more efficient in the way that they deliver services and mm -hmm. use our our tax dollars. Absolutely, and I think this is some of the work that the county wants to do in the next year, and the, the main thrust of the, the Transforming Systems Together work is to make sure we're um, aligning programs and administering them in a way where they're gonna be most successful. So before I left the department, I, I had a conversation with someone in Hennepin County and they talked about some research they did on applications they received for human services programs and how 50% of them got denied, not because the family was ineligible, but because they didn't have all the verifications in place. And then what happens is those families reapply later with more of that verification and they need to be reprocessed. Well, the bulk of your work is processing and reprocessing applications because you don't have the, the information uh -huh. there to process them, that's really inefficient. Yeah, it really and is. And in that yes. period, yeah. you, are, you are having families who continue to experience crisis and they're likely to compound that crisis. If you can't get access to childcare, you might lose your job, which then puts you on cash assistance, which could leave you homeless. Whereas if that initial application were processed efficiently and correctly, and you got that service you needed, Save money. It, it would save money, exactly. Um, so for me, that is one of the biggest issues I see is how can we implement those more effectively? I'm really impressed um, on some of the work that I've heard and seen um, being done that they're starting to do, for example, with the new, um, there was a new homeless shelter uh, opened in St. Paul and they co-located some services there so that people didn't need to go down to the, you know, the, the East building in downtown St. Paul and figure out parking to get, apply for services. They had people there processing their applications for all the relevant programs that they're eligible so we can get them supports and stable and get them back into stable ongoing housing in mm -hmm. the workforce. Um, so I think that's a big thing for me is how do we make sure those services are easier and, and, and it's something they're doing with other programs so our a lot of the programs and information and records are being combined into a, a unified team so there is no wrong door you go to one counter and you can have all your questions answered in the property records and assessor's office department it's not like you need that's to be in wonderful. this lane that line yeah, that's great right that's yeah. more efficient yeah. and we're cross training we're building yep. capacity yep. So if somebody wants to get in touch with you, yeah. how do they go about doing it? <laughs> no, that's great. So there is, um, on the Ramsey County website, if you go to government, you can find the Board of Commissioners page and you'll find my, my phone numbers and my email address. Mm -hmm. um, it's nicole.fredham at ramseycounty.us. Um, feel free to email, give me a call. Um, Happy, happy to get in touch with people and to meet one-on-one -on -one with individuals or groups to hear what challenges they're facing. Um, okay. We are in the process, because this was a special election, most folks, they get elected in November and then they get sworn in in January. So they have a, a okay. few months to get stuff together. Um, I didn't have that luxury. I, w I was elected in November and That's sworn right. in November. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I have, uh, each of the commissioners have one staff member to help support the work that they do and mine starts next week. Yep. Um, I don't have yes. my cards printed yet or anything, but I'm working to, to get things established so we can start uh, representing constituents as soon okay. as possible. Yeah. Well, thank you very much yeah. for uh, joining us today on your Business Matters. Yeah, well, it's a pleasure thank to you. talk with you. Thank you. You've been watching Your Business Matters. For more information on this program or the White Bear Area Chamber, visit whitebearchamber.com or call 651-429-8593.